say I am free because of what the Lord has done for us and we welcome you today to this week's edition of the Pentecostal Holiness Church International for all over the world the Spirit of God is moving all over the world as the prophet said it would be all over the world is a brand new revelation of the Spirit of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea, the knowledge of the Lord, it's coming. And so, we welcome you today to this true Pentecostal holiness service. Glory to God. We welcome you today to this time of prayer and intercession before the throne room of God. We welcome you today to the preaching of the word, to praise and worship and congregation hymn singing. 
and we give the Lord our God, Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God, all the power and glory and adoration due to his name, the three in one today in Jesus' name. Jesus himself said in his word that in all things he must have the preeminence. So let this service today be none of us and all of him. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father God, in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name, the only name under heaven and earth by which men, women and children may be saved. Oh, glory to God. We welcome today, Lord, Father God. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And as we stand before thee today in prayer and intercession, making our requests and petitions and intercessions known to God. We know that it's a flow of intercession, the river of life, coming down from the throne. And we tap into that flow of intercession today about what the Spirit and the Son are interceding to the Father. For Jesus Christ himself is our great intercessor. And he ever liveth to make intercession for us before the throne. <speaking in Spanish> Thus saith the Lord, there is indeed, my children, a river of life flowing out from the throne room of God. And in every believer the same river of life. For out of thy bellies shall flow streams of living water. For, said the Lord, it is in me that every one of you lives and moves and has a being. Tap into that flow, my children, saith the Lord. And learn to go with the flow, but not the flow of the world, which leadeth to perdition and destruction but the flow of the river of life. For out of that river is my life and my Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God. Let it pour forth this river from every one of you today. Do not be dry and dead as so many of my churches so-called have become, but flow with my life, my health and my peace, all in my name, name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, today for thy word to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank thee today, Father God, that thou sentest thine only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And indeed, in the words of this wonderful worship song, turn our eyes today upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth shall go strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Will grow straight. 
strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The ripple of life, the bringer of life. Glory to God. Hallelujah, Lord. In Revelation 22, we read this, verse 1. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life? Oh, Father God, everything in me is life. The pure river of the water of life. The tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse that time. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face. And his name shall be on their foreheads. And there shall be no night there. They need no candle the light of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever oh glory to God we thank thee today Father God for those wonderful promises for thou art life the resurrection and the life Jesus himself said when on the earth I am the resurrection and the life. He said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one, no man cometh to the Father except by me. Oh, Father God, today, thou knowest the evil plans of the enemy. Thou thyself said to thy disciples in the John, he said, the enemy has nothing in me. The prince of this world is coming because it is foretold that I must go and suffer and go and die on a dreadful cross rejected and outside the city walls for thee. That's what he was actually saying. But he hath nothing in me. Glory to God that the work is done. He said, I have finished the work father gave me his last words were it is finished he accomplished everything for us oh glory to God for all for all my savior died said the apostle John Wesley he did it all for us all we need to do is say Lord I believe all things are possible. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Lord, I Join with this now, dear viewers and listeners. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. All things are possible. Thank you, Lord. 
God, by faith, we know that we are already sealed by the very Spirit of God, and that His name shall be on our foreheads. As we read in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, and we will take no other name, and we will take no other mark in Jesus' name. Lord, make this revelation now in the name of Jesus to the church, your true church, every single person who is saved, who is being saved, who will be saved and born again. Show them, Lord. They must take no other mark, Lord. They must take no other mark. Or we read in Ezekiel, even in the Old Testament, it warns in Ezekiel chapter 9. It warns. The God says, the Lord God said, the men who have charge of the city, Jerusalem, to draw near every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. Ezekiel 9 verse 1. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate, which lieth toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand. And one man among them clothed with linen, purity, with a writer's inkhorn by his side, and they went in and stood beside the brazen altar. And the glory of the God of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was to the threshold of the house and he called to the man clothed with linen which had the writers in corn by his side and the Lord said unto him go through the midst of the city through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof and to the others, he said in mine hearing, said the prophet Ezekiel, Go ye after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Say utterly, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And begin at my sanctuary, O oh, Father God, in these last days. I pray, Lord, a stand in the up for the true believers and those who will come to believe on the Lord and they will have understanding of these scriptures that you will lead them to these words Lord that you have already said that I will save to the uttermost those who sigh and cry for the abominations you see round about them Lord thou hast already set the seal of the Holy Ghost I'll talk about the mark on their foreheads. The mark of the Holy Spirit of God. And then, thou promises thy church in Revelation, in the letters to the churches, and even in the very last chapter, talking about having a new name written upon them. Thee and the only will thou serve, Lord, we come against those evil spirits of Antichrist, the deception, Lord God, that would seek to deceive even the elect. I pray particularly now for those known to us, Lord, 
And I'm thinking of our dear friends in the Lord who have been deceived into using suspect Bible versions from different manuscripts which are not of thee, Lord. And those who have been deceived into false alliances and connections which look on the surface good but are really the deception of the enemy. Lord, send thy Holy Spirit if it be possible, Lord, to undeceive the elect. Lord, protect and preserve thy church today for we are thy body on earth. We are as thee on the earth to do thy work to the very end as long as thou needest as you have said thy word says over and over that they who endure unto the end shall be saved and we will have no other gods because in the words of this glorious song Jesus is all we need we need no other name no other mark but the name of Jesus the all-sufficient one, the master of all creation, protector, preserver, almighty. Our hearts are filled with praises to thee. Hallelujah, Lord. Jesus is all I need. Glory to God, the all-sufficient one. How we love you, Lord. You are the all-sufficient one, El Shaddai. We glorify thy name. Hallelujah, we look, we lift up our eyes to the coming King. And the things of this earth shall grow strangely dim in the light of thy glory and grace. Thank you for being with us at this time, working in us and through us. This is a time to look to the cross and the finished work. And we're going to sing this most beautiful hymn now by Isaac Watts, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Hey! 
It's the last line of that, Lindsay, to the realization of the demand. Mm. You know, the demanding of our soul, our life, our all, means our whole life, not part of it. And it is this within the context of staggering not. at the promise. You know, we were given the Abrahamic promise mm. and it is this we're talking about today. Thank you, Lindsay. She'll be back later with our congregation hymn sing. But I was touched by a quote today by J.D. Drysdale, formerly of the Emmanuel Bible College in Birkenhead and also by a YouTube video I watched from an Orthodox priest who had gotten saved in the Nazarene church but became an Orthodox priest. And he said something very profound. For so many evangelicals had been to him saying, call no man father except he produced scripture after scripture where men on earth have been called father. And the Bible says, remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. And he said something so profound because instead of entering the legalistic arguments of what one should call oneself in ministry, he simply pointed out that that really wasn't the issue. The issue was our love towards others. And that as a father, as he was called in his orthodox faith, for he had formerly been a pastor in the evangelical world, he felt he could love the people more. It's very profound. We're not here in our meeting to enter theological discussions. The Bible does not give that as the criteria for ministry. The criteria for ministry is whether or not we have, as Isaac Watts wrote, given our whole soul, our life, our all. 
For God is far bigger than the technicality. For it's with the heart we believe and the heart alone. The Bible says we are continuously to be content. But the way my football team has been performing this year, with the exception over the last week in Glasgow, that has been almost an impossible task. But we're talking something far deeper than football or any other earthly pursuit. We're dealing as to whether or not we are in the will of God. J.D. Drysdale wrote this. <clears throat> Discontentment shows an incomplete consecration. An entirely consecrated man has ceased to choose his lot in life. He believes he is in the place where God wants him to be. He believes that all things work together for good to them that love God. We are wholly consecrated. We are just waiting divine orders to go or to stay. You are continuously, in other words, in the obedience mode. And if we are discontented, we need to ask whether or not <coughs> the old man has been destroyed, who is the author of the spirit of rebellion in our hearts, the chaffs as divine providence. Whatever happens, therefore, we must learn to be content. I want to talk further today following on from our miracle healing service, which for some strange reason seems to have brought us a strike on YouTube. Hence, our programs this week are not going out through that platform and through Facebook alone. For within the context of talking of the faith of Abraham, we brought in the contrast of Egyptology and how one so called denomination has bound itself to the obelisk of Rome rather than the understanding that we are the children of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. There seems to be a great misunderstanding in relation as to who we are and what we are and what we are called for. And it is so in that light I intend to take forward this meeting today. I am strangely challenged at this time in relation to the naming of the Antichrist. Oh, I've been convinced for years of what the Antichrist is. It is the seat of the smallest state in the world. And I say that without any doubt whatsoever. It's only to decide which particular papal office we are referring to when it comes to the Antichrist. For on every cross of Rome, there are sun rays going out. And that tells me those of us who understand occultic mythology will know sun, S-U-N, represents that great yellow ball in the sky, a physical phenomenon. For that is the deity of Baal. Hence the Bible says, what concord hath Christ with Baal? So we draw a division 
all the way through the scriptures, going back from Elijah when he took on the prophets of Baal. It can only be that of Baal which signifies the Antichrist, for it has only been Baal that has taken on the Lord's anointed throughout the whole of Scripture, the religious order. The Pharisees and Sadducees were a Baal, as indeed is the whole Roman Catholic Church. Yet there are those within it at this time who are fighting their own hierarchy, saying we are the Lord's anointed, and they're saying that by separating themselves by what they see occurring in Rome under the obelisk. Throughout the Vatican are idols, statues, representing Roman mythology, which were syncretized by Constantine, to bring about a Christian faith which not only presented Christ, but presented his enemies, his enemies of Baal. All around the Vatican are the idols of the Canaanites, are the codices which Lindsay referred to of Vaticanus, Alexandrinus and Sinaticus, the base of all new translations. And their partnership with the United Bible Societies to bring about the Nestle Alan text is clearly of the Antichrist, for it denies the Christ born of a virgin, calls him a son of the gods, and desire, denies him manifest in the flesh. There is only one Antichrist, but there are many Antichrists. How can I explain that? As we are the branches to the vine, so the occult is simply a copy, a counterfeit. And as we are branches to the vine, so antichrists are branches of the antichrist. And that antichrist, without doubt, is the Pope of Rome. And it grieves me to say this, that nearly all of the charismatic movement and now nearly all of what were Pentecostal denominations have bowed down to the antichrist of Rome bringing their people unto subjection of wickedness, debauchery, even to the degree, and I quote one church which was operated in Wales, church in inverted commas. We even had words from their God to swap their wives in one meeting. We saw one such lady when we were operating in North Wales who had had her husband swapped at one of their meetings. Oh, we're dealing with the God of Baal, who had, according to its mythology, Baal Bera, baby of Baal, born to a virgin. Oh, the similarity is so great that it has even deceived the elect, hence Lindsay interceding that if it was possible, the deceived elect could be brought back into the fold. But even though the Antichrist, the manifestation of Lucifer himself, The arch god of Freemasonry. The case of Rome of the York Rite of the Knights Temple of the Knights of Malta. Even though 
this operation leading up to the great tribulation has as its title the God of this world, even though Satan himself offered Jesus as he rightfully could do because of the sin of Adam, the kingdoms of this world. What the Antichrist does not have is the true word of God and so few have it today. That is why the Antichrist has taken out the Bible from nearly all of what are known as churches, even the one here at Whitton. It no longer preaches the blood of the Lord Jesus, no longer preaches the demand on our soul, our life, the demand on all of us to be given to all of him. Such is covenant. Such is the Abrahamic covenant. And I'm covering three passages of scripture today. Genesis 14 and 15. Romans 4. Staggering not at the promise of God through unbelief. Being strong in faith. Giving glory to God. And Galatians 3, a church the apostle wrote to within the context of their bewitchment. And that is my question today. Who has bewitched you? What saith the scripture? Abraham believed God. It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Yet all around us is unbelief. We're about to minister to a man with a life-threatening condition of aggressive can cancer. Where can we find people to join us who believe? People crucified with Christ who live yet not them but Christ. They all believe. Lindsay sung either on this occasion or on another occasion. I can't remember exactly when. Lord, I believe. Now she shouts, Lord, I believe all things are possible. Lord, I believe. Now to him, and I read from Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. How do we believe? Oh, we walk the paths of righteousness, as J.D. Drysdale pointed out, in full contentment, his description of contentment being always ready to hear to obey whether to go or not to go. And I know God has called us to Glasgow to go. Right at the back of St. Mungo's Cathedral. To intercede and bring conditions for a man's recovery. Even as David also describeth. The righteousness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without work, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. And cometh this blessedness, then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision only, 
also. For some at that time were looking for an outward rather than an inward sign. And our righteousness is manifest from within rather than without. Then Paul asks a question to the Romans. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, he received Excuse me, the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had not yet been uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe. Who was that father? Oh, my quote from the Orthodox. Priest, who was full of the Lord, is so telling. Though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the faith of our father, Abraham. You see, to have a doctrine in the scriptures, you need to have more than one reference. And you need to know the context in which a reference is given. For in the whole of the Bible, there are many fathers. And perhaps in the setting of fathers on earth, there is a principal father. And that principal father began in one place. And it is here I turn to our second group of scriptures way back in Genesis and chapter 14. To the one place where we must all begin. And I'm referring it in this context to the place where we are all circumcised. For not only did he go to the cross, we who are born again went also. For there is no other place to become a Christian than the cross of Calvary. And here we have the enactment of that very cross of the symbols of that cross, the broken body and his blood shed for us, his being brought to us within the context of who the Bible describes as the father of us all, Abraham or Abram as he was called at this time. And he had had a great battle and had taken the spoils of that battle to one place and to one place of old. And that is to the symbol of the cross of Calvary. Melchizedek. Stir a few up. And the writers of the Hebrews, who was Paul, said, do not believe the textual critics who lie to you continuously. 
the writer to the Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, refers to Melchizedek <coughs> of being of the priesthood of our Lord Jesus. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest and the most high God. And he blessed him and said, Bless be Abram of the most high God, possessor of heaven and earth. And so we have two clashing scriptures. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 refers to Satan, Lucifer, the devil, as the God of this world. But I am telling you this, when he faces the children of Abraham, the father of us all, he faces those who know their rights as possessors of heaven and earth. Hence this ministry is to become the Lord's protectorate. In May 2023, when our ministers shall be anointed with oil to become the protectors of the nation until the original coronation service is performed. And we shall perform it here in Whithorn, Scotland, the cradle of Christianity. And another word for the devil today, from those who are possessors of heaven and earth, blessed be the most high God who hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. the devil has been delivered into the hands of the possessors. But there's a condition here. The condition is this. He gave him tithes of all. This is why we read in Malachi of those who refuse the tithe were under a curse. The primitive church took it further than the tithe. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. We learned over many years to give all we had to the Lord, our house being in his name and not ours. You see the possession, being the possessor of heaven and earth means recognizing the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of all. And it requires a finishing, a finishing with ownership. So we've covered Romans 4 as far as we need to go today. We've taken it back to Genesis 14. And interesting, in 15, the instruction to Abram was to fear not. A phrase commonly used in all of the scripture. And to conclude... We deal with the bewitchment occurring in Galatia. Observance of the law or faith. 
if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed. And as he, Isaac, and all his descendants are of this seed, and that we therefore can claim to be possessors for the circumcision of Abraham began not with the knife on the phallic symbol which we witness in St. Peter's Square, Rome. For why that is a true sign of the Antichrist, it is a witness of a physical circumcision. Oh, isn't it so subtle? For an obelisk is that of Egypt, of Egyptian mythology, of a phallic symbol. To make it plain to you of a male willy. which under the law, under the Mosaic law, was required to be partially cut. But those of the faith of Abraham, 430 years before the law, for we declare him to be our father. For the law was given simply to bring understanding of right and wrong. It was not by observance of it that righteousness could come. That occurred on the day of atonement when the high priest, having shed the blood of a lamb, took the sacrifice of the holy of holy to cover the sins of the people in preparation for the great day of Calvary, when all of that was no longer required. And there are those prophets of Baal who would seek to rebuild a temple in Jerusalem <coughs> with the same outward sign, thus denying the Christ. All of these parts of the Vatican plan of the Antichrist. So once more, people can be saved through the physical act rather than denying self and giving all on the cross to the Lord Jesus Christ. For a false form of Christianity has come. The bewitchment of Galatia is all about us. Who hath bewitched you? Asked Paul. That ye should not obey the truth. Paul went on to talk of the great suffering he had been through in his life. Quoting again Abraham, who believed God, and it being accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore the day which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. You cannot have faith unless you know you're a child of Abraham. The scripture for seeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. I believe our coming as the Lord protector us will be a forerunner of the millennial reign. The Bible already calls us kings and priests. 
It's not that we're recognizing something far off. We're recognizing something which has been biblically set, so we have an it is written for our activity. As many as are of the works of the law under the curse of the law, curseth it every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith, the law being not of faith, Christ redeeming us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. It is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Now do you get it? Where did Abram go to the symbol of the cross of Calvary? The table of the Lord. What else does it, what else does it symbolize? But the broken body and the blood of Christ shed for us. Now do you get it? Have you got it? Has the bell rung? The tree is referred to here. Curse is everyone that hangeth on the tree. Why? So that the blessings of Abraham. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we got it. We've been in Genesis 4. We've been in Romans 4. We're now in Galatians 3. Have you got the picture? And may, look, I'm putting the jigsaw puzzle together here. Have you got it? Romans 4. Galatians, no. Genesis 14, 15. Then Galatians 3. That the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or added thereto. So we, being born again of the cross, have a father Abraham, possessor. I like that. And to prove my point, we have verse 16. To Abraham and his seed. If ye be Christ, are ye Abraham's seed? Where the promise is made. To seeds as of many, but as of one. To thy seed which is Christ. For Abraham brought his tithe to the very seat of Christ. This I say, the covenant confirmed before of God in Christ the law, which was 430 years after, I've already quoted that, cannot this and all, that it should make the promise of none effect, for if the inheritance be of the law, no more a promise. God gave it to Abraham by promise. Are you receiving that promise today? Or are as Paul asks in the following chapter, or are you returning to the beggarly elements? No wonder Lindsay's coming to sing, I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost. When time is surrendered, it's about to surrender. The earth is no more. I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. Isn't that amazing, Lindsay? Amazing revelation. <laughs> I, amazing tell you, I, I, I tell you. I tell you. Come, come, come and share 
Oh, hallelujah. Well, it's quite amazing, really, isn't it? No. Um, I had no idea myself, actually. It, oh, David has been uh, talking about or preaching about Abraham for two days now, but it, it's all fitted in about the, the priest of the order of Melchizedek being a forerunner of the cross, isn't it? I mean, it, it's it's quite extraordinary. So that's how we end up back at the cross again. Before David spoke the word, we were singing, When I survey the wondrous cross. And what the demand is, demands my soul, my life, my all, because of the amazing love that kept him on the cross. And now we're singing again. This is... Crucial, literally crucial, which means of the cross. I believe in a hill called Mount Calvary. I believe whatever the cost, because it costs us all, as it cost him. I believe. We need to learn to keep going no matter what because he's still God to it all. Life is easy when you're up on the mountain and you've got peace of mind like you've never known. But then times change and 
here down in the valley Don't lose faith for you're never alone For the God of the mountain He's so God in the valley When things go wrong So God in the bad times, the God of the day is still God of the night. You talk of faith when you're up on the mountain, oh, but the talk comes easy when life's at its best. But it's down in the valley of oh, trials and temptations. That's when faith is really put to the test. For the God of the mountain, He's so God in the valley. When things go wrong. The God of the day is still the God of the night. The God of the days still God of the night. And we sure need to remember that song because we have lots of trials and temptations that we're going to go through. Mountains, yes, and many valleys as well. So that's why it's so important, that last song. You see, believing in the hill, move along a little bit so they can see both of us. The cost. You see, as Abram brought his tithes, so you must do also. When the earth is no more, I'll still cling to the old rugged cross. As Abram brought his tie to the cross, in effect, we must do also. You know, the Lord Jesus died that we may live and live in abundance. And him who knew no sin became sin for us. That we should become the righteousness of Christ. The branches of the vine, members of his body, flesh and bones, partakers of his divine nature. Indeed, a child of Abram. And that to possess as Abram possessed, we must do as our father did and bring our tithe unto the table of the Lord. The God is a covenant God. And it is no excuse to say, well, that's Old Testament. For if ye be Christ, are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And if Abram, as he was then, brought his tithe, then we must do also. Or else, as Isaac Watts wrote, as we read in the primitive church chapter, of the Acts of the Apostles. We read that they laid everything down. They were all in one accord. They had surrendered their lives fully to God. So as you give of your tithe, of your offering, of your all today, we ask you if this has become your storehouse to give unto the Bible College of Wales original vision. For we believe in that hill called Mount Calvary. We do believe whatever the cost. And when time has surrendered and the earth is no more, we will still claim for it's at the cross we were saved and redeemed where we give our all. 
are crucified with him and are risen up in resurrection power. And at that point, we will say, Lord, we gave our all. We gave our tithe. The details of how to give are on the credit showing. God bless you. Thank you, Dave. This is a crucial message you've just given there. That's all part of it. What we've been, he's been preaching on today, the table of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the forerunner of the cross, representing the cross, and Abraham and his tithe. So thank you for being with us for this service this week, this program of the Pentecostal Holiness Church here in Whithorn. God bless you. And continue to meditate on these words you've had today. And we look forward to the next time we're together for the next meeting of the Pentecostal Holiness Church. God bless you. Remember, the time is short. He's coming back for his bride. Amen. So we need to make the most of the time that's left. Bye for now. God bless you.